My name is Amy Hadler. I work with our partner teams here at Neo4j. We have Igor, who is the uh, the head of uh, all things cloud for the product team, and uh, Sean Elliott as well from Microsoft, um, one of the cloud architects at my Microsoft and one of the Azure specialists. So today we'll be talking just very briefly about graph databases and uh, the implication for enterprises, graph and cloud, how to get started, so we'll be doing a demo, and then time permitting, we'll talk a little bit about native graph as well. So with that, I'd like to actually talk a little bit about what it means to be a connected enterprise. So I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you are uh, experiencing some of these, uh, some of these factors in the market right, right now. Um, we'll definitely have a very hyper-connected world and you probably have products and services that um, rely very heavily on intertwined cross-domain data and processes. Um, engagement economy, I think we're, we're all involved in that on both sides of it, um, with the increasing demand to have decisions made um, you know, very currently with whatever um, factors might be going on, um, whatever current input somebody might be, um, might be engaging in. And then, of course, um, just disruptions and dynamic market itself. So as you, uh, as I'm sure most of you feel that, you know, just the dynamic nature of our markets really spur us to kind of continually um, reinvent. And with this kind of environment, you know, these are very things that are very, very much driven by connections that your decision applications really need to be connected as well. So how you're making your decisions have to also be looking at relationships and connections. And you know, if we're, if we're looking at the products and services, you know, the implication of that is that you have a, uh, a single, you know, easily maintained um, platform and a single way to have um, always current view of data relationships across both internal and external silos. You know, if we're looking at the engagement economy, that also implies that you have to have a framework that supports the real-time decisions because of the expectation that things happen. You know, if I put in an input into a form, hit submit, I need to be able to log in immediately, you know, not 10 minutes from now. So, so having the ability to do things like that. And then, of course, if we're talking about the, um, the dynamic nature of the markets from a planning perspective, that just means you have to have a very flexible model um, that your applications can use to leverage connections and evolve because it's hard to plan or rather you really can't plan for what you don't know about. And so I'm sure we're experiencing these things. If we look at these main elements together, it, in, in addressing them really helps a company um, thrive as more of a data-driven connected enterprise as opposed to being um, reactive to that connected, uh, connected nature of the environment. And if we look at what that provides us, it lets us do things like building applicate management and, and modeling applications that accelerate productivity and effective, effectiveness when they can view the entire service network that your products and services might be um, depending upon. It also helps you eliminate stale recommendations by using the freshest data at the time of decision to really improve the customer experience and integrate a broader range of, of relevant data. It also, um, so, and I have a couple quotes here that I'm not going to read. So we have customers that are actually experiencing, you know, the results of using, you know, graph to do that, a graph database to do that. But I don't want to forget this um, flexibility because the other thing that also gives you is the ability to create more disruptive long-term um, uh, applications leveraging these hidden relationships and also allow you to move very quickly. And so I do like the, um, the Gartner quote here is really interesting, their view on um, graph analysis being an extremely competitive differentiator. And something that um, we'll talk about later is just the ability to sustain competitive advantage. So with, with that, I have a quick polling question. We're going to talk a little bit about graph databases and the folk, how they focus on these connections. But Corey, could you go ahead and show the polling question? It's just yes. a level set for us. Thank you. Yeah, so the poll will go ahead and show to the audience now. So please take about 30 seconds and select your answer. Great, and so as you do that, what we're really looking for is just how familiar you are with graph technologies. You know, some of you may be completely new, and uh, some of you probably have uh, installed or are already using Neo4j or, or perhaps some other graph technologies as, as well. 
Excellent. It looks like about 20% of you are already graphistas, so that is wonderful. Awesome. About 25% have installed Neo4j, and about 13% have used a graph database before. Um, it looks like we've got about 35% understand the basics, and about 10% are totally new to the concept. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, Corey. All right. And back to, Alrighty. Back to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for, um, for participating. It's really great to see the range. Um, it sounds like we have quite a few people that are, are really comfortable with, with the graph concepts. So I'm going to quickly go over, um, just for the people that you know, maybe are a little new, um, some of the what we think about um, when we talk about graph. And it, it, so, so graph databases are really unlike other day, database models. And you know, basically, you know, they connect data, especially Neo4j in a native um, graph database as it stores it. And so that's, you know, that's an easy summary of, of how it's different. But if we wanted to, to quickly compare to something more people are familiar with, we might be something like a relational database. And relational databases um, are actually perform very well um, for data structures that are well understood, um, that don't change too frequently. Uh, maybe there's known problems with discrete parts. Um, you know, not needing a lot of connectivity to to other sources. It's uh, you know a little a little more static. Um, for instance, if you were doing a monthly statistical analysis on a known data set um, that maybe gets updated but doesn't change the model, the perfect use for for something like that. Um, graph databases, however, really do well when we're looking at things where where the data topology is difficult to predict, but you still need to be really efficient in how you handle it. And that could be, um, and Native Graph actually does that very efficiently because of the way it stores and computes relationships. Um, it also uh, means that transversals, so as you move between data points, um, they're very fast. fast. And you can actually reduce um, the resources consumed by orders of magnitude that way um, versus an RDMS um, kind of store. Um, it also does really well where you have dynamic requirements because of it, with a schemaless model, it's easier to evolve and change um, as the business changes. So you don't need a watershed kind of approach um, to, uh, to your application design. Uh, it also does really well whenever relationships in between your data contribute significant meaning and, and value to the application itself. So it's kind of a quick overview of, of some of the differences. Um, the other thing is, is you know, we, we really love watching, uh, watching some of the trends here in the popularity of Graph. And so Graph overall, so this is a, a ranking from DB Engines. Um, we get, I think this came out just a couple weeks ago. Uh, but we follow this, uh, you know, since this has been started in uh, 2013, and you can see the popularity of graph has really uh, taken off in general as, a, as an area. And so that's kind of a, a fun thing to watch, and um, we feel that, um, that that's going to continue to increase, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later on, on why we think that is. Um, but I will say that there are some common graph database uses that we notice, and in particular for um, Neo4j, and they range from real-time recommendations, a knowledge graph, identity, um, and access management. And these are things that have really developed um, from our customers. Um, wasn't <laughs> these weren't our uh, our initial thoughts on you know originally what we were thinking about for for Neo4j, uh, but it's really interesting to see the span of use. So for real-time recommendations, we have customers like Walmart um, that uh, are able to provide uh, immediate recommendations and better customer experience. We've got a, a Fortune 100 brand, uh, bank that is uh, looking at uh, fraud detection, um, network and IT operations, uh, companies like uh, HP maintaining, um, you know, making sure that their, you know, their servers or routers and all the uh, services that route uh, that rely on those are up and uh, up and running. Master data lineage. Uh, and uh, master data, excuse me, and data lineage. So master data, that's one of the things that uh, the Cisco is actually using for um, with Neo4j, uh, knowledge graph or graph-based search. We have customers using um, with that use case. And of course, identity and access management, we have uh, customers like UBS uh, using that. So what's really interesting is that we're now um, starting to see some very data-driven companies that are actually taking a graph first approach. So these are very specific uses. Um, but what's interesting, it sounds kind of radical, but some of these 
um, more advanced, connect, very connected, um, data-driven connected enterprises are actually starting to look at their um, data projects um, from graph first standpoint. And it's, you know, like I said, it sounds a little radical, but when you think about, you know, the leverage points, you know, thinking about should I be looking at this graph? Yes, no, no, fine, we'll do something else. But that being a first thought is something we're starting to uh, see evolve as well. And it's very fun to watch a lot of our customers start with a specific use case and then expand. And, and we see that uh, that happen a lot as well. So thank you for uh, sitting through the, uh, the level set with me. I'm going to hand this over to um, Igor now, and we'll, we'll take a little more look at Graph in the Cloud. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Igor Borovic. I'm a director of product here in NEO, and I am responsible for all the things cloud here in NEO, and very excited to talk about new initiatives we are doing uh, with NEO 4J in Azure. So before I jump into that, let me talk to you about a few reasons why deploying Graph Database or NEO 4J in cloud makes makes sense just in general. So, so first concept I want to lead with is a data collocation. Um, very important decision when you're designing a new system, you you know you're deploying or designing a new application, is to think about the center of gravity where you of, of your data. Where is your data located? And and I would argue that. You know, if you're building, like, for example, a knowledge graph, as you've seen in, in, in the use cases, common use cases for, for graph databases, um, having more data and more relationships, it will only enrich and bring the value of your data set. And augmenting your existing data set with additional data sets can only increase the, that, that value. And these data sets actually already live in the cloud. If you think about a Twitter graph, if you think about a LinkedIn graph, if you think about Facebook graph, if you think about any kind of new data sets um, currently generated, um, they are already in the cloud. So the data sets you want to augment your data set with are already in the cloud. So it makes sense for you to have your center of gravity for your data in the cloud. On top of that, probably if you're in a bigger organization, probably your workload already is in the cloud. Uh, because you know corporate workloads are moving to the cloud. You know the investment, as you can see here, uh, is is expected to increase sixfold um, over the just the general IT spending, the investment of of, of IT uh, departments of, of moving their workloads in the cloud. So your applications or consumers of your data sets of your graph applications. Um, are probably already in the cloud. So so locating your data set, locating your graph engine into the cloud, uh, I would argue, makes a lot of sense. Um, secondly, one of the key reasons why using a graph database or graph model is that it's very flexible schema, right? It's a, Neo4j has what we call this uh, schema optional model, where you're creating your, your nodes in a relationship, and as you are creating those nodes, different types of nodes, and different types of relationship, you're basically enhancing your schema. You're creating new relationships, you're, you're deleting relationships, you're changing the schema as you go. It's very flexible data model and very flexible data set. It's, it's growing and, and shrinking over time. And, and I would argue that those kind of data sets are very naturally would be able to be deployed on the cloud because cloud also as a computing platform enables you very elastic um, elastic uh, properties like ability to scale up and out with your data set or scale down so and then you can tweak to have a faster network a slower network so you can do a lot of these things very elastically uh, so I would argue that graph databases in general and the Neo4j in specific are very good fit with the, with the cloud deployments um, Specifically here on Azure, you will see later you can you can add more more clusters to the Neo4j, and you can remove clusters. So it's it's really really neat uh, platform for for Neo4j. Um, next, I would like to talk to you about security. So um, 
security is the one thing that almost every single you know C CIO is thinking about, and and I've been just recently found an article that uh, it says that the security in the cloud is probably more robust um, and more mature than you would have in your legacy systems for various reasons, but the perception of it is that it's less so because of the major you know news about Target and others that got, got breached. But because cloud it needs to be secured, a lot of more thought is being put into that. There's multiple layers of protection. Even if you look at the data centers, they're probably much more physically secured with, with, with cameras or physical uh, processes than you would have if you are just in, in a company where your employees just can walk over to the server and pull the plug, things like that. Um, so that's generally on the cloud security. But uh, specifically, Neo4j, recently in, in latest release, we introduced role-based access control. Um, so we, ha we, have, uh, we have upgraded our security in, in Neo itself. Neo, as a non-SQL no -SQL database, is actually an ACID database. So if you think, you know, oh, it's a non-SQL database, well, you don't have any protections on your data, you don't know if data is, you know, uh, durable or whatever. Well, Neo4j is actually a true database, it actually is an ACID database. When you have a transaction, so when you commit a transaction, that data will be durably stored um, in, the, in the system. And, and, and Microsoft, a well-known name in uh, over the last 20, 30 years, has been through a lot of different phases, through to the beginning of Windows and later on. Um, Microsoft Azure is, is a, a perfect fit for uh, deploying your workload in, in a trusted environment. Um, finally, I just want to say that um, the difference of downloading Neo and, and running it on your on your laptop or trying it on your local server versus just using um, platform like an Azure uh, model where you have a template where you just click through enables you to focus on your application while all the infrastructure is being taken care of. The metrics already work, the measurements already work, you get billed by the, by the usage that you consumed and you can be up and running in an hour. Um, you can use your own data set or you can just use the sample data set that we provide with Neo4j and you can quickly get up and running and explore, do POCs, but also do your production deployment and then scale as you go because the cloud, as I was mentioning earlier, the cloud platform uh, enables you to scale out and scale up quite easily. So, so with that, um, we recently announced um, at our user conference in Graph Connect in London in, in May that we have now readily available a template on Azure to deploy Neo4j high availability cluster. And I would like you to show you a demo of it. And I will try to change the screen without crashing and go to meeting. So bear with me for a second. I want to walk you through that. I think it would be really interesting for you guys to see that. So here it is. Um, this is Microsoft Azure. Um, portal. So I'm logged in here with my, my username and I'm going to look for Neo4j. I'm just going to search for Neo4j on the databases marketplaces. Oh, look, there is a Neo4j high availability cluster and I have it here. So this is a bring your own license model. So here you need to um, contact our uh, you know account representative to get a trial license or, or have an agreement with Neo4j to be using Neo4j uh, Enterprise Edition. Um, and then you got billed from Azure for using the Azure compute resources and, and network resources. So let's go ahead and click Create. Uh, let's say, so here there's a three-step template. It will ask me for a basic configuration options on, on uh, what is the account name of the VM that we will be using, we'll be using password, SSH, public key. Let's say we're gonna use a password. Um, gonna use my very strong password here. It's subscription is on called Igor subscription. And we can create a new Neo4j resource 
um, resource group. This is the resource group from Azure in Azure where it's gonna all the services gonna live. Location, let's say Western United States. Um, go next. Here, this is the single page of Neo4j settings. So you can choose the version. So this is super easy. This is um, the password that you will be using to access Neo4j. Once it's provisioned, you will be uh, shown the screen of Neo4j browser and you need to have an initial password. Of course, you wanna change that password after you log in. Um, this is an SSL certificate to be used um, to, to access the HTTPS of Neo4j browser. Uh, if you don't provide any, the self-signed certificate will be generated. This is the name of your cluster. And then how many, you know, we can create a cluster of six or, or two or three, let's just say cluster of high available cluster of three instances is enough. You can choose the size of your DM. So let's see, I'll choose something smaller. Let's say I'm just exploring. So that's one core and three and a half gigabyte server. So in that case, three and a half gigabyte is the entire memory available. Uh, probably one gigabyte is needed for just operating system. And then two and a half gigabytes will be available to Neo. Uh, among that, we will probably give half of it to, to the page cache and the other half to the Java heap. This is a Java process. And this is automatically uh, configured. Um, so you don't have to do any of this configuration. This template will automatically do that. I'm just gonna use this default subnet and the public IP address will be generated. Uh, it's gonna be called Neo IP001. So later when it's provisioned, you're gonna just look for this resource to know your IP address. Um, let's go back, click OK. Here it's validating. And this is it. Now it's now it's validated. You can click purchase. So here you're agreeing to the terms of use. Uh, by clicking purchase, you would agree that you have a license from Neo4j. I, I, since I work in Neo, I can click purchase. So I'm just going to take it. And now this is uh, being um, deployed. Probably takes somewhere between um, anywhere between 10, 10 minutes and, and, and 30 minutes. Uh, so it's pretty quick. There's nothing else you need to do uh, comparing to the downloading Java, configuring your Neo uh, server, configuring Neo4j configuration uh, file. This is just literally, a, I call it single click. I clicked more than once, but this is it. And with that, uh, I think we would have another polling question. So, all right. Or it, over to you. Perfect. All right. So for our next polling question, we'll go ahead and push that out to you guys now. The question is, what is your cloud approach as an organization? And you can go ahead and select um, one of the answers as we did before. So we'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and select your select your answers. So while, while we're waiting um, for everyone to, to, uh, to look at their poll questions, Igor, we had a, a question come in via the chat, um, which you're all welcome to use, that uh, it was a question about the trial license that you mentioned versus purchasing. Can you um, give a little more detail on what the, the timing of that and, and how that gets included? Yeah, that's actually a perfect question. Um, um, I should have explained it a little bit more. Um, you actually do not need to contact us if you want to be under the trial license. So if you read there in terms of use, it actually says by clicking here, you, you could be considered as a trial license. And that trial license uh, lasts for 30 days. So just be, be noted if you're part of a big organization or whatever, just for the compliance reasons, you should probably, you should not exceed 30 days without contacting Neo. But there is uh, uh, there are links in that template. Once you are close to the 30 days, uh, Click contact Neo and, and um, drop a note to one of our account representatives and we can easily get you um, longer trial license if needed or just start talking with you what kind of a commercial um, needs you have around graph databases and Neo4j in specific. So we can, we can deal with that. But yeah, you, you're free to kind of just click and, and play with it and then be considered under the trial license 
Uh, if you are part of the organization that has really, actually has bought NEO license, has a subscription with NEO, uh, just please know that the same terms of how many cores are you allowed to use would uh, be uh, uh, affecting your, your license. So if you move, if you don't have it on your on-prem server, you want to deploy it on Azure, you just need to see what kind of uh, server are you using for your instances. The one that I provisioned was uh, four gigs, one core, so there will be one core, free instances, there was a free course being used there. So great question, thank you. All right, great. So I will go ahead and close the poll now. It looks like we have about 50% of our audience um, who is saying that it really just depends on the project uh, to determine the cloud approach. Um, after that, it's looking like 26% that are taking a cloud first approach. So we've got it depends on the project followed by cloud first. And then after that, we have cloud only and on-prem first, both at 10%. Um, and then our least likely option is on-prem only. So here we go. All right, Amy, you should be seeing the, um, the notification pop back up. I do, thank you. So my screen should show fairly quickly, but you know what, we had actually one more poll question. Let's go ahead and push that now and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Native Graph. All right, so here's the poll. Um, <clears throat> it is, what is your experience with Microsoft Azure? Um, and your professionals at this by this point in the webinar, so I already see tons of answers flooding in, so thank you. It's looking like most of the audience is considering using Azure, um, followed by people that already are using Azure and have an enterprise agreement. Um, so I'll give everyone just another 10 or so seconds, so I've been seeing these answers come in very quickly. So still looking, uh, majority is um, considering using Azure, almost 50% of our audience, um, followed by we're already using Azure, followed by we have an enterprise agreement for Azure, um, and then our lowest percentage is that um, we have committed plans for Azure at about 14%. Thank you, Corey. All right. All right, back to you, Amy. All right, thank you. So, uh, so thank you, everybody, for um, for you know for spending time with us. I'd like to talk a little bit about Native Graph because that comes up as a as a common question. But I'm going to try to get us through this um, in about maybe 10 minutes, so we can <laughs> leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, if we take a look at um, you know at what's going on in the graph marketplace, we already saw. Um, the stats that showed us that graph is becoming, graph databases are becoming really popular. Um, back in 2014, uh, Forrester said they thought um, by this year that we'd be 25% of the enterprises would be using graph databases. And we can estimate, or actually we know um, what our numbers are, you know, being Neo4j, and we're, we're quite excited that, um, you know, as of this year, there's over 50% of the global 2000 using or piloting Neo4j. You know, so from our perspective, that's, you know, pretty exciting, but also um, what's really interesting is if we look at uh, overall what's going on in the graph marketplace that um, we see quite a bit of activity and you'll notice um, you'll notice this is a log scale so you know there's quite a bit of growth um, but we're seeing about one new entrant a month into the market which for us just shows that the market is you know there's still a lot of market interest it's a very exciting time to be in in the graph space and graph database um, so so you know overall it's that's pretty interesting for us to um, to look at and we think there's a lot of market validation here. So there's a lot of different entrants. There's, you know, Microsoft has um, the Azure Cosmos. We've got uh, SAP, IBM participates. So it's just a lot of validation that, um, that it is a, 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 a popular choice for people, especially, you know, people with a lot of connected data. Um, so one thing you might notice is there's a couple different models and um, I'll talk a little bit, and that's what I wanted to talk a little bit is the, you know, some of the different models here. And um, in general, if we think about, you know, the, the disparate <laughs> nature of the data that we have, 
and um, you know how they how they need to operate together, but <clears throat> they're often in silos. What Graph can do is help bring together those silos and relate the information that would normally be very difficult to to bring together and really multiply the value of the data within there. Now, to take a little bit of a <clears throat> side note into the different models, Neo4j is a native graph model. And what that means is that even if we're bringing together information from and data sources, um, data from other sources, is that we bring it into this native um, graph um, data model and storage. And we do the work up front to integrate and, and store these relationships as we're bringing in information. And that approach is really well suited for complex queries, um, things you need really fast results, you need really fast um, reads on that. And that differs a bit from a multi-model graph approach, which is layered on top of. And that's really about adding graph capabilities for queries. Um, and it works well for, for less complex queries with less hops between data. And that's, um, that's really because the work to integrate and to look at data relationships in a multi-model approach is really done at the time of query. So as opposed to doing it up front and you speed up the query, multi-model um, does it at the time of query. Um, so it can be very good for, for people who don't need to do um, the complex queries or um, don't need that, that really fast, um, fast response time. So with Neo4j, you really don't need the inter inter intermediaries, um, but it is very good for bringing, uh, bringing together information across you know, different silos. And I've talked a little bit during this, um, this session on naturally storing information. And we talk, we talk a bit when we, we get into the details of Neo4j about this index-free adjacency. And that really means that you're just, you're always one hop away from your next relationship. So it's a, a, um, a node to node relationship. And that really helps us ensure these, these super fast retrieval of, of the data and the relationships. So with Neo4j, it, we are completely focused on graph and we're exceptionally fast because of the way we continually capture connections and then naturally store the relationships. And it, what that really provides you is a couple different things at the output level, what the business gains is, is really this performance at scale. You can store data more efficiently. We have one customer that stored, you know, 20 times the workload or you know, processes 20 times the workload with half the resources they used to versus a, an RDMS. And you also get very fast results as we've mentioned. But you also, um, one of the things we also work on in regards to flexibility is also helping people accelerate um, productivity with you know, ease of use tools. We've got a very popular um, query language, Cypher. Um, we have a uh, procedures that, um, that you can borrow and leverage in a, in a very, very healthy and active community as well. Um, we also, you know, we talked about flexibility, you know, the agility um, that you may need to easily adapt or, or remove data sources without uh, schema changes or, or downtime, which is really important for a lot of our partners. And um, then also just, you know, quickly, you know, it's about sustainable advantage. So you can innovate and leverage relationships over and over again. So you can enhance your existing solution, you can create new solutions, but you can continue to evolve that over time. So you're not locked into um, one particular uh, data source or have difficulty add it, adding them. So we really feel like these four things together are really why um, Neo4j is the world's leading native graph database. Uh, we provide technology that gives, you, that gives any organization the ability to leverage connections in data in real time. And that's, you know, that's really the focus of, of what we try to do. And we've had quite a, quite a bit of success with, um, you know, leaders in industries, you know, from financial services to, to media, uh, to telecom, social networks. And these are just some of our customers, um, but they're, they're some of the verticals that, uh, that uh, we, we have quite a, quite a bit of traction in. All right. Awesome. So again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to talk to you soon.